Good afternoon, Nairobi, and welcome to the Coldplay Africa side event on what it takes to develop and manage a digitally enabled field force. My name is Charlie Habersham, Senior Project Manager at Dalberg Advisors, specializing in digital agriculture, youth employment, and gender, and I'll be moderating today's event. I'm joined by my colleague, Abida Faresh, and Kabukuru, Lead for Operations and Commercials at Safaricom Ag Platform Digifarm, Shri Baratam, Founder of and Chief Mentor at the Social Enterprise Kuza, and Emmanuel Maku, Head of Technology and Product Development at Mercy for Agritech. I'll let the panel give their own introductions during our discussion later, but I'm already excited to learn from this diverse panel representing a large telco, social enterprise and NGO with experience in both South Asia and East Africa. At Delberg, we've been working in digital ag for a number of years, helping our partners to leverage tech and data to improve farmers' lives. Across all our projects, we find that no matter how good the technology in order to penetrate the market and drive impact, it must be complemented by a human touch. This is a challenge we have seen lots from our partners. And so in today's session, we hope to share best practice and learn from one another on how to set up and manage a digitally enabled field force. So over the next 45 minutes, we'll have a short presentation from my colleague Abida from our recent case study on field force before moving to a panel discussion and an opportunity for you to ask the panel questions. So please do post your questions onto the chat and we'll do our best to answer them during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Abida to present a summary of our case study on how to develop and manage a digitally enabled field board. Over to you, Abida. Thanks, Charlie, um, and thank you for the introduction there. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'm going to be running through a presentation on how to develop and manage a digitally enabled field force. We'll start off with the basics of what is a digital Seem to have lost a bit of that. Okay. I'm a bit confused as to why people have dropped off there, but uh, I'm happy to pick some of that up. Um, so let's see. Can people see my screen now? Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. So it now seems to have gone blank. Yeah. Anyone see that? You can see that now. Yeah, we can. Great, thanks. All right. I'll, okay, so I'll, I can pick this up now. Can people still see that? Um, and then just let me know if um, Abida comes back onto the call, and then I can I'll let her pick it up from here. Um, but but as Abida was saying, so we'll be looking at what is a digital enabled field force, and why are they relevant today? How has COVID nineteen shifted their value and relevance um, and then look at the 10 principles for adopting and successfully implementing a digitally enabled field force uh, before we zoom into two of those key principles. Um, so firstly then, field forces act as a crucial gateway between smallholder farmers and organizations um, and, a, and a field force can, can fulfill a number of different roles for a digital platform or digital product or service. Um, that could be data capture, so registering farmers, collecting of data for input distribution and yield projections, so soil testing and geotagging, or a collection of gender disaggregated data. 
It can be around awareness and trust building. So to support the lead organization to raise awareness and build trust around the use of products, services, uh, financial products and digital tools. Um, it can it can be used for farmer education and support. So digital and financial literacy training, farm demonstrations on good agricultural practices, for example, how to apply inputs. Um, or it can be on issue identification and escalation. So monitoring farmers throughout the season for early identification of issues for escalation to the lead organization. So field forces have always played a critical role um, in, in any digital product or, or service. Um, but COVID-19 has really um, impacted rural econ economies and amplified the value and relevance of digitally enabled field forces. Firstly, it's allowed for digital training. So COVID-19 in increasing the emergency of digitalization and amplifying the role of agents in conferring digital skills to smallholder farmers. Uh, in digital information dissemination, agents and digital tools can be leveraged as an accessible and trusted conduit for the dissemination of information. Uh, linkages, so agents are a crucial information source for organizations that can no longer reach smallholder farmers due to mobility constraints. Um, the continuation of service provision, ensure that farmers can continue gaining access to increasingly critical extension services, such as loans for inputs and customer acquisition. So COVID-19 has increased the importance and uptake of digital tools for customer acquisition. Before I jump into these principles, I just want to check if Abide is back online yet. No. And just checking that everyone can still hear me clearly. Can everyone still hear me? Sorry. Yes, okay. Right. Can hear you. I just wanted to check. Um, cool. Okay. I'll uh, I'll continue there then. Um, so, um, so 10 principles for adopting and successfully implementing a digitally enabled field force model. Um, so firstly, when establishing a field force, the model should be aligned with the organization's objectives and vision. Um, this can be if, if you're looking at, say, a more entrepreneurial model, thinking about how, do your field, how would your field agents fit into that overall vision not only with the skills and expertise, but how do you share that vision with them as well? Um, the field force design and desired outcomes should inform that agent persona that an organization recruits. Um, and we will deep dive into that um, in, in a moment. Thirdly, it's crucial to make early investments in a strong management and support network around the agent. Um, investment in onboarding and training should be made up front to ensure agents are fully prepared and supported in their role. An incentive scheme should be designed to drive the right behaviors and achieve desired outcomes and be com um, clearly communicated to all actors. Digital tools are critical success enablers, but need to be underpinned by clearly defined processes. A really critical one um, for me here. Um, technology is not always the silver bullet. Um, you must identify and plan for agents' critical touch points throughout the season to ensure their experience and that of the farmers is optimized. Um, and number eight, which we will also be deep diving into, um, that we should map the, organ uh, map the agent journey throughout the season and plan for both the busy and the quiet periods to mitigate against the associated risks. Take time to understand local complexities adapting products and ways of working to meet the needs of agents and farmers. And finally, monitor and evaluate agent and smallholder farmer performance and put agile processes in place to allow for pivots in the model. So to quickly deep dive that, that second one around the field force design and the desired outcomes that should inform the agent persona that an organization recruits. And when we were looking, supporting organizations and looking at that, we really saw a number of different key skills that you should look for. Um, 
and some may be more suited to an entrepreneurial model. And when we say entrepreneurial, this is often more of an incentive based uh, pay structure versus an employee model. Um, and some of the key skills that we'd look for around um, agronomic and value chain expertise. So all agents require some some of these expertise, but but that could um, that can vary um, depending on the model. Community trust is the core requirement for all agent models, as they need to build personal relationships with farmers. Digital literacy increasingly important for all models. To, due to a shift from manual to digital reporting and data collection tools. Um, an entrepreneurial mindset, key to the success of models that are rooted in activity-based compensation. Mobility, the degree that agents are mobile, may define their ability to complete, um, ability to complete agent activities. Um, and, and important to know that these constraints are often gendered. And financial stability, Part-time entrepreneurial models require agents to have some financial stability outside of their agent role. Um, so some key, key things to consider when recruiting um, your, your agents into the network. And then this other one we were interested in deep diving is around mapping that agent journey throughout the season and planning for both busy and quiet periods to mitigate against the associated risks. Um, so. As you can see, um, the, the amount of activity requires varies throughout the year, and, and at the same time, that cash flow um, will vary. So, ensuring that you manage that in the right way can help to keep agents motivated and reduce um, churn of staff. Um, the occupation rate and compensation of air agents varies throughout the season, um, and time space should translate directly into compensation. Agents are often selected. For um, for being lead farmers. So this means that busy times for farmers are also busy time for agents, something to always bear in mind in your planning. A flat commission rate doesn't account for agents in areas with poor roads and or low farm farmer density. Um, really something that we, we have seen across multiple, uh, when looking at in different counties or in, in, different, um, in different value chains that one size fits all um, plan will, will not always work um, when it comes to payment. Uh, and during aggregation, agents must balance multiple responsibilities, high workload and high operating expenses. And that's when it could be uh, interesting to bring in some surge support to your core agent network. Um, so that really is a, a summary um, of, of our case study. Um, and I would like now to, to turn to our, to our panel. Um, and, and just a reminder to participants to, to post your questions in the chat box if you have anything around the presentation um, or if you have anything, um, any questions in, in particular for our participants. Um, but before diving into questions, I'll, I'll start by asking our panelists to quickly introduce themselves, um, starting with yourself, Shri. Charlie, thank you so sure. much. So I'm Shri, I'm the founder and chief maker of Kusa. Kusa is a social enterprise and a certified B corporation, which specializes in identifying rural youth and grooming them as micro entrepreneurs. We call them agriculture entrepreneurs or agripreneurs, each of them working with an average 200 farmers, providing the farmers the ability to learn about good agriculture practices, connecting them with the supply chain and helping them grow their economies. So currently we are working in three countries uh, between Africa and South Asia and have a network of over half a million smallholder farmers serviced by 3,000 plus agripreneurs. Thank you, Charlie. Great. Thanks, Sri. And Anne. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Guru. I work in Digifarm. Uh, Digifarm is a subsidiary of Safaricom PLC. And um, we, we, we have been set up as a social enterprise as well. And uh, our core goal or our core purpose is, you know, aligned to this Safaricom's goal of uh, transforming the lives uh, of, of people, of our customers. And in this case, we are looking at transforming the lives of farmers. Uh, we, we, we were set up about four, three, three to four years ago. 
Uh, so far, we have a platform of around 1.4 million farmers, but our model today looks at an end-to-end -end journey where we are looking at around 60,000 farmers who are active on end-to-end, -end. and end-to-end -end means we give the farmer access to inputs, we walk the journey with them through, um, uh, through the field agents as well and providing extension services, and then we provide access to market to the farmer. Uh, at the moment, we have engaged so far around 800 active agents, uh, empowered them digitally. Uh, it's been a learning curve and we are still learning, but happy to be here and uh, pick insights and learn from my colleagues as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. And good to see you back, Abida. Um, I know you are based in Eldoret, so perhaps suffering from similar challenges that digital agents do as well uh, with rural network connectivity. <laughs> Uh, but uh, over to you, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, thanks, uh, Charlie. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, my name is uh, Emmanuel Macau. I am uh, the head of technology and <laughs> development, and also a Kenya country lead at uh, Matico Agricultural. Um, Matico is uh, uh, from Matico Agricultural. Uh, work with innovators to design, test, uh, and scale digitally enabled services for uh, smallholder farmers uh, across Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, Ethiopia. Um, and uh, obviously, in particular, this is uh, one area we have uh, really focused on uh, in terms of digitizing uh, the field for, uh, and a lot of work has gone into it uh, with our partners, uh, Digifarm, and a few others as well. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, good to be here to share our experience. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you all for your introduction. So um, we will um, jump into some questions. So Anne, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Uh, we heard in the presentation that recruiting agents with skill aligned with your overall objectives as an organization is critical. So as Digifarm, what skills and competencies do you look for in your DBAs? Uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, like I said, it's been a journey, but I think uh, key competencies and skill sets that we look for is one, uh, you mentioned it, uh, is a lead farmer. And within that, we are looking at at least three competencies within that. We are looking for a leader, and a leader is somebody who is able to lead people or motivate people or mobilize farmers uh, and influence farmers to behave in a certain way. Uh, the other thing, of course, we look for within the lead farmer uh, 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 skill set is he, the farmer, he or she, being a farmer, means that they have uh, uh, either they can be able to transfer good agricultural practice, you know, from doing it themselves, you know, leading from, uh, you know, the front, uh, sort of leading by doing, by doing, you know, so that if you're trying to influence farmers to behave in a certain way. The best way to teach them is giving them an example. And one of the examples is you as a lead farmer. The other thing we are, we are keen on is proximity to the farmers. And we, we are clear that we need a, a, a field for steam that is as close to the farmer as possible, that lives and resides within the farmer group that you live, that you lead. And therefore, it's critical for us that you, 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 know, you come from the same village. The, as your farmers, as the farmers that you're in charge of. Uh, the other thing that we really look for is, of course, technology know-how or technology savvy. Sometimes it can be a challenge, but I think the way we look at it is, uh, even if there, uh, you might not have the technical know-how at that point, but the learning agility, or if you're able to learn, and we can pick that at the point of recruitment. There are people who have never seen a smartphone before, but you give them a smartphone and, you know, you, you walk them through what they need to do. They are quick to learn. So it, it's a combination of possibly technical know-how or even just the learning agility to us that skill set. Of course, we also look for a, a powerful communicator, a good communicator or and with good interpersonal skills. We also look for some level of literacy, at least ability to read and write and communicate as well. Uh, we also try to be careful not to get overqualified teams, uh, but I think for us, we just look for basic 
uh, 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 basic uh, education. And entrepreneurial mindset is also critical for us because our model is entrepreneurial. We pay based on incentives or it's an activity-driven engagement. And therefore it's about, you know, uh, delivery based on, uh, um, you know, you earn based on uh, your delivery on certain activities or certain aligned or agreed on KPIs. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, a, a very clear set of um, skill sets there. Um, so that, that's, that's really thinking about when we're re recruiting for, for our agents. I, I'll think about now where, when we're sort of managing that field force. So, Shri, I'll, I'll turn to you now and think, just to ask you about, as we think about then managing our agents, how are, how are you and, and Kuza using digital tools to upskill your field force and, and how is that working? Yeah, great question, Charlie. So fundamentally, uh, our model is about identifying the local youth. So we rely a lot on youth and enterprising youth. So for that, it is extremely important for us to go about campaigning, screening, selecting, consulting the key opinion leaders, understand the cultural context. So we invest a lot in identifying the right set of people. Now, when we get them on board, the first thing we do is upfront, as Charlie, you were sharing as a good practice, is we put them through an incubation process. We set up something called a youth ready incubators. These are rural entrepreneurship development incubators. These are virtual incubators. Thanks to COVID, we challenged ourselves and put together over 840 plus micro learning videos, all preset in a device and handed over them. Over a course of 15 weeks, the youth to actually go through step by step where they learn, learn from the mentors, learn from peers, contribute by applying what they learn within a week. So like that, it incrementally grows. And three things happen in this process. One, they learn. And second, they connect with their community, each entrepreneur, youth working with about 200 farmers and then growing as a network. So the uniqueness about our model is that we don't, we are not transactional in our approach. It's just not activity-based. Yes, compensation is activity-based, but we look at supporting them for one season at least so that they stay focused. They start seeing the trust that they earn from the communities, and then they connect with them with the ecosystem partners. Like Anne said, we are also bringing in a lot of other strategic ecosystem partners for inputs, fertilizers, and others, and grow them. So digital is fundamental to all of this. And also most youth are digitally literate or they're born with digital skills. I don't know how, but they seem to be embracing them real quick and are able to apply and grow. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, really interesting to hear about about that commitment to a season um, and, and really sticking by the agents. and, and I think, yeah, complemented with with that incentive scheme as well, and that that leads me to my next question for for yourself, Emmanuel, around incentives. We know that that does play a key role in in driving agent performance. Um, from your experience, um, supporting a, a, a number of different organisations, what should an organisation consider when developing an incentive model? Uh, thanks, Charlie. Uh, I can talk about this. The whole day, but uh, I, I'll just pick a few points. Uh, number one is uh, the objectives of the organization uh, matter, and they will determine uh, the type of model that will be will be adopted. Either it's an entrepreneurial uh, model uh, where the commission based based on uh, activities that have been done, uh, or uh, it will be an employee uh, or employment uh, model where um it will be salary based for example um or maybe it's a hybrid so it would be a combination of both uh in instance as well we've seen one of our partners giving out their time and some uh some uh, um monthly uh small amounts just for uh, taking care of transport and logistics uh and then there's a commission now based on the activities that they're doing um Number two, it's, uh, I think it's important for us to also just look at the, uh, at, at, at 
uh, the cycle or the, the copy cycle or the journey that the, the, uh, the agent will go through. And I think you mentioned this, Charlie, uh, in your presentation that uh, it's important for us to uh, map out that uh, cropping cycle uh, or cropping season. That will determine what activities will be done at what, what points uh, by the uh, agent. Uh, and then it will determine uh, what uh, or when or what periods are actually the busiest, uh, how much needs to be uh, also reserved uh, for that period, uh, how much heavy lifting is going to be, uh, to be done. Uh, that means you know things like aggregation, uh, a lot of heavy lifting is done there. You mentioned that, uh, uh, Charlie. Uh, at the beginning, when this recruitment is uh, you know signing up the farmers, is uh, 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 you know helping them get input. So that those are two activities already, and they are very heavy. And then obviously throughout the, in the middle of the season, there's you know some calm. Uh, there's now uh, agents can be able to visit the farm, uh, so that. There's an incentive for the farmer, to, uh, for the agent to go and visit the farmer, you know, just see how they're doing, uh, give them some tips, um, you know, and, and look at the progress and do also another activity like geo tagging, for example, uh, or even estimate the yield. You know, so at that point, there's not so much. Uh, and then obviously the compensation has to be somewhat uh, fair. Uh, we also have to compare with what is in the market. Uh, another thing, uh, my third point would be around funds, um, which is a key component actually. And if we are to make this incentive model uh, uh, run smoothly, uh, we need to make sure that uh, it, 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 it's what the agent type. Uh, and not only that, it also covers additional costs like transport, logistics, uh, uh, and um, Obviously, at some point, uh, we need to be able to pay the agent uh, once they've, they've completed their tasks their task or activities, uh, and their reports are coming to this digital platform uh, that they're using. Uh, you know, payment should come, uh, you know, and should not be delayed. Because what that means is that they uh, demoralize them, slows down their work, uh, creates uh, tension uh, in the field. Uh, they stop actually concentrating on the farmer and now start thinking about uh, uh, when they're going to be paid. Um, so this is something that is very critical. We've seen this a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a really big uh, pain point. The other thing is, uh, uh, on my fourth point is around training. Uh, 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 when you're training the agents, it's very important obviously, for the organization to think about how the communication and the information that we give out um uh during the training they should uh you know articulate clearly what the incentives are how the uh, agents will be compensated uh and uh, how they should actually you know um uh you know uh, document what what they've done so with the use of a digital uh, uh platform they are able at least the organization is able to track what they've been doing and where they've been going and it's also uh, helps them do reconciliation. Uh, funny enough, even the agents uh, in the field, uh, once you've communicated uh, the activities clearly and how much it costs per incentive, they actually document everything that they do manually. And they come and compare with you and they do, you know, some uh, very basic uh, uh, reconciliations, especially where there are discrepancies. Uh, and it helps a lot because you can see that the agent is, is involved. And the organization is also keen uh, and they are monitoring uh, exactly what they are doing. Um, we need to be able to set KPIs uh, early in advance. And this is obviously even during the training part. Uh, we need to be able to you know, articulate the processes that uh, uh, we have to bring claims uh, and what the deliverables look like at least from, from, the, uh, from the agent. And then lastly, I think, um, just the way, uh, uh, an ordinary way of motivating uh, people is to recognize good performance um, and reward them accordingly. You know, and there are some simple things like, uh, you know, giving them branded merchandise, uh, uh, even giving them airtime, um, maybe uh, a small promotion, uh, you know. Um, or a trip uh, to the to, a, to the city, for example, just for training. 
and they really take this thing very seriously. It might look like it's a, you know, it's very small, it's something very small in my niche, but for them, it actually, you know, motivates them to do more. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they feel like they're part of the system. Uh, we should also now, obviously, uh, as an organization, also expect to get feedback and ask them that feedback immediately or as soon as possible, uh, especially on the incentives and uh, as much as possible, uh, try and adapt and change uh, because obviously the situation on the ground is all, uh, always very difficult. Great. Right. Let me stop there for now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manu. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, um, really critical part of, of managing a field force. So, Shri, um, one of the big challenges we see, as, as we've heard from Manu and also in the presentation, is, is managing the ups and downs of the seasons with very busy and very quiet periods. So how do you, Akuza, uh, keep agents motivated during the quiet periods to ensure retention? Oh, thanks, Charlie. It's a, that's, I think, is a billion dollar question, if you ask me. Oh, the interesting dimension is if I just speak about specifically Kenya as an example, an average Kenyan is doing about three different things. Now, that's a very interesting dimension. People are extremely enterprising. Now, they've figured out what to do, what not to do, how to do, and when to do. So what we've done is we brought in this concept of portfolio of work by design. Rather than telling people, as part of mentorship, we always see that they say, I do this, I do this, and I also do that. We say, okay, there's no point challenging them on the thinking. The best is to create related livelihoods. For example, when we say each of our entrepreneur or agripreneur is working with 200 farmers, that's it, that's about 200 farms. But if you look at the other side of the farmer, on an average, they may have about two cows, few hens. So there's the asset a smallholder farmer holds is livestock. So when our entrepreneurs are going and digitizing the farmers, they're just not only digitizing the farm and the farmer, they're also capturing the assets that they have and what else they do, how many family members, what is the average age of the people. So what we are doing is on the other side of our one network, which is a kind of a marketplace solution we're putting together, we are crowding in multiple services and solutions and products that are of need for a family. On an average, a high school dropout youth who is working as an agripreneur from the farming business on a minimum of one acre is handling a business of approximately 200,000 US dollars. But when you add the other portfolio to it, that's almost doubles up. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, livestock has no life cycle. It has got a life of its own. And around the livestock and around the other associated needs of a family, of a farmer, there is enough that would keep this entrepreneur busy. As long as they are able to earn commissions, as long as there's a transparency built into it, and that's how we have figured out. And initially, we thought an agripreneur is coming in to do only inputs and access to market. But they have been teaching us across countries. In Mozambique, we learned something very interesting. Out of operations from 10 Indian states, we learned something. And from in, in Kenya, we are operating in 14 different counties, both in central, western, and also the ASL counties. Uh, we learned something. So when we look at it, step back and see there are 16 different archetypes of these agripreneurs that's popping up. Now, that is where they are super specializing, and that's where there's an opportunity for them to do. And when you put all of this in a matrix, and have somebody overseeing them, and this is one of the important pieces of the success of our model is, for every 10 agripreneurs, we have somebody overseeing them. Uh, call it a mentor, call it a somebody who is shadowing them, ensuring that for about a season to two, they are they're hand holding them. And that is when a lot of people fall out. If they don't see money, especially youth, they just look at something else. They're hustlers. So what we ensure is that there's a continuity and they also understand the importance of a customer relationship a marginalized farmer need not necessarily be a marginalized mind. They are clever people. They, they know what to do. They already understand how to survive. They have been surviving for years. There are 500 million smallholders who are surviving even today, of course, in a very $2, $3, $4 income per day. But they, they are teaching a lot. And as long as they embrace and the entrepreneur is able to 
bring the currency of trust, then the magic begins. And this is where we have seen that the retention levels for us are close to 98%. About 2% people fall out. And we also seen when we are doing this closer to big cities, the attractions are very many for the youth. So initially, we started off by working in the remote locations, just keeping that factor in mind for retention. But now we are realized that, I mean, if I can loosely say it, some of the youth are finding agriculture. Uh, I mean, they're bringing in the concept of making agriculture sexy again because they go around with a very clever looking backpacks. We have designed a backpack which is designed to work without internet. They have a set of gadgets with which they are able to run their business in a backpack. They are able to facilitate other services. And this is where uh, I think the difference is coming right now. Thanks, Great, thanks a lot. And I think lots of people are interested in how can we make um, how can we make agriculture exciting for youth again so um it sounds like that that backpack could be one of the one of the solutions I, i'm keeping an eye on time and i would like to give ourselves a little bit um of time just to get some questions uh from from the audience but Anne, I'll, I'll i'll ask you one final um question and that's it it builds on on one of the points we made as well around it so digifarm obviously works across multiple counties and value chains um, so how do you use your agents to manage those local differences and, and complexities? Thanks, Charlie. Uh, yeah, it's a build up to what Shree has comprehensively shared. Um, and you're right. Uh, we do, when you work in multiple counties and you're working with multiple value chains, you'll find then there are very different dynamics you, you need to adopt to different value chains are, are different, you, you know, and if you have the same value chain, even in different counties, people perceive or people's understanding is also different. And therefore, uh, uh, for us, one of the things that we, we really look to, we, we really work closely with the, the local administration. The local administration is the chiefs and the sub chiefs who to a very good extent have a feel of uh, you know, uh, how does, how do the farmers work there? What is the mindset of the farmers around there? Uh, and when we recruit also our, our, our DVAs or our field force, we also refer, we also get a lot of referrals from the local administration, you know, just to have some kind of referral or, uh, you know, a, a point of reference. Uh, the local administration also helps us in driving barrazas or meetings. And what you'll find is the local administration will also have some level of uh, a trust or confidence to the farmers, will drive some level of confidence to the farmers. And therefore we really depend on that to just, uh, you know, if, if it's a good, uh, you know, some practice that we are trying to tell farmers, if farmers, for example, are used to intercropping and here we are telling them, if you want to be a commercial farmer, uh, you know, some of these things are, are, are better off without intercropping. It takes, uh, you know, a lot of influence, both from a local, uh, you know, even from the DVA, and that's why I said the DVA needs to be a local person, but also supported or complemented by the local administration. We find that to be, uh, you know, a, a powerful tool. Um, the other thing is, of course, what I said, the DVA needs to be a local person, somebody who lives and re resides within the community, is well accepted, is known. If you go to church, people know them, they see this person in church. You know, they have some commonalities that are uh, not necessarily, um, they are livelihood driven. You know, you see this person in the shopping center all the time and you know he's a son or a daughter of so and so. And with that, you find that it's easy to, to communicate or to change the mindset of farmers or to, you know, to, to, to send a certain goal or a mission to the farmers when you're using a local team. Of course, the other thing that we do is use, a, especially going forward, one of the models we've adopted now is demo farms. And what we are trying to do is also work with our manufacturers, our key stakeholders to support also the demo farms because you find um, demo farms sometimes can be scattered far and few between but what we are trying to do is get into a scenario whereby every DVA at least can run a demo farm. Uh, preferably, he is, 
his farm can be converted to a demo farm. And with that, you find a lot of engagements being driven a lot around the demo farm from the trainings uh, will drive a lot more, uh, you know, um, is more, you know, when farmers see what we are talking about, then they believe it more. And therefore, it's for us to bring, you know, like the demo farms or that visibility closer to them, for them to, to be able to believe in the same. So for us, I think those are some of the, the things that we, we try to use or tools we try to use to navigate the complexities around uh, um, different cultures and different dynamics. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I'll, I'll turn to the, some of the audience questions now, and I'll put this out, and, uh, and please feel free, whoever feels well placed to answer this. We've had one one question from a, a, gra a grassroots organization, and uh, I suppose what, what they're thinking about is kind of how do they, with limited access to funding and finances, how, how do we think they could be smart about implementing a field force at, at, a, budget, at a budget or looking to secure funding to, to train their farmers? Um, so I suppose that, that first area around, what, what are the smart things that you can do to, to manage a field force at, at, at a budget? Uh, I, can, I can take that, uh, Charlie. Um, I think the thing we should do is uh, just figure out uh, what your objectives are. Um, uh, and that will also determine, will help you determine uh, what kind of model you want to take. Do you want to just employ a certain number of uh, agents or do you want to have uh, you know, a blended uh, either hybrid uh, model where you have uh, either um, uh, employed or an entrepreneurial mind uh, uh, or agent or, or basically an entrepreneur in your, uh, in your agency model? Um, each, each one of them has uh, pros and cons, um, uh, but the, the entrepreneurial one obviously uh, helps you to manage uh, your, your uh, and, and uh, also uh, figure out if, uh, what to expect in terms of um, uh, what to pay. However, you also need to think about a business plan. You need to think about uh, um, what it will cost you uh, if you can't even figure that one out, uh, uh, then obviously you can't start uh, to just hire people and give them work uh, and you don't know how to finance uh, uh, the activities that they're going to do. So you need to put those, uh, you need to uh, figure out your cost, uh, you need to figure out how, how much it costs for you to serve that one, one farmer uh, 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 by having this agent. Uh, and then how does it affect the bottom line? Uh, and if you sell the pro your produce in the end, does uh, the income or profit from the produce, uh, um, does it uh, come back to actually give you a return on the investment that you did uh, on the agency model? So you have to really consider uh, what your business plan will be. Uh, you have to consider the model. You have to also consider your objective. Uh, and then that will also determine, uh, you also have to, you know, figure out how many agents you want to have. Uh, that will determine uh, then how you intend to fund it. Uh, at least uh, from that point, then you'll have uh, some sort of an idea. Over. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks for that, Emmanuel. Um, a specific question for you now, Anne. Um, one, one participant has said, like, I think it's a common question that shouldn't digital replace the need for agents. So I think the the idea of that the Digifarm have a network of eight hundred agents. Um, what what for you is the the ideal farmer to field agent um, uh, ratio? Um, and have you seen that digital has has allowed you to to reduce that, um, or, or do you think that is it, that that field agents is still really required despite the digital um, advancements? All right, thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, like I said, it's been a journey. Uh, to just answer the last part of the question first, it's been a journey, and I think when we started, we were looking at a ratio of around two hundred. Uh, uh, field agent, 200 farmers per field agent. But we're doing this study and with continuous interaction in the field and just looking at the level of intensity 
that is required when we're engaging these farmers that when and even just to to bring on board the technology aspect of it uh, because we're looking at tasks such as geotagging which are heavily intensive we, we uh, after this study it was clear that it either needs to be between 100 to 150 and therefore what we are driving at is just making sure that we maintain it at 100. Um, obviously when it comes to is it sustainable and is it possible to then digitize the field activities uh, I think there's a part of it that maybe can be digitized but some uh, you know to a large extent might have to remain physical uh, what we are looking at from our side as Digifarm is looking at uh, can we have like a call center where farmers can call in and ask for agronomical support and the question we are looking at answering or asking ourselves is is can this then complement the regular visits that a, a, a field person or a field agent will need to do to the farmer? Uh, you know, because even the challenge around the movement, and I think you highlighted that in the case study as well, it is big. So uh, the ratio that we are looking at, ideally, if we were asked, it would be around to 100 to 150 ourselves. We are working towards the 100 ratio. Um, and we feel that there are several ways which we can actually serve the same purpose digitally. Call center is one of them, uh, but we have other tools such as WhatsApp for business and you know different platforms that I think some farmers might have access to. Maybe not many of them, but those are some of the, the, the options that we might have in terms of managing uh, you know, the same exercise digitally. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we probably have time uh, just for just for one more question. I, I'll put this to um, to Shri. Is that um, you've obviously worked in in a, a different regions, um, both in South Asia and East Africa. I wondered if, when you're thinking, when you when you've set up and run your social enterprises, are there any differences you've had to consider when setting up a, a field force? Oh, absolutely. So a lot of it is extremely contextual. So we have digitized and created end-to-end -end videos for uh, about 40 different crops. That is right from how do you do identification of uh, seed to land preparation to pest control, post-harvest, all of them. But then as much as there's a standard operating process, of, or it's also called package of practices, but when we go into a uh, local context, we needed to localize it because the pests are not the same everywhere. The diseases are not the same everywhere. They are very, very hyper-local. So one is as a program design, we have to keep that in consideration, number one. And number two also is the, based on the exposure and the skill sets of the talent available within the community, a lot has to happen. So there are places where we have on an average for every 20 entrepreneurs, we have one mentor shadowing them and handholding them. And there are instances where we have, based on the geography, based on the terrain, we are operating at one is to 10. So the, the ratio varies from that. And what is more important is uh, we can't just have one size fits all. There's a lot of localization that happens. And this is where we work very closely with the community-based organizations who are on ground, who understand the complexities. And like Anne said, we work with the key opinion leaders in the community. And we always co-create a model. And even at the time of selection, we ensure that everybody in the community knows that so-and-so youth is now getting picked up to become this. So with their blessings, we start the process. Then the chances of they embracing them and the chances of they being tolerant with them and giving them a longer rope is very high. And they take care of them as their own family members. So yes, it is uh, for every 200 kilometers, Everything changes in a country like India, right from the culture, the food, the habits, the soil type, every 200 kilometers. Now, how do you do it across 10 different states, which are like 10 countries on the continent? So it, that is where we are using digital technologies to mass customize. And as you see, when you do a mass production, it is the same product getting repeated. And when you customize and personalize, you are bringing in premium into it. What the digital platform, the way we tame the technology is to give the ability for every ecosystem actor to get the advantage of personalization, 
but also at a mass scale. And that's how we have been able to exponentially grow our communities 10x year on year. Over. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, looking at the time, I think I'll just I'll, I'll draw this to a, a conclusion now and, and just share a, a few a few takeaways. I think I think it's interesting that that final point, and we as you said, we heard it from from Anne as well. It's around this kind of the there's a challenge around uh, localization and ensuring that you don't take a one size fits all with with your agent approach. But at the same time, um, it's your agents provide that opportunity customization they provide that opportunity for localization to build those relationships or even be part of those important local communities um, that, that help to embed your product or service uh, with with your customers um, secondly I think really this opportunity to motivate youth and to engage youth in um, in agriculture um, it we know that that uh, youth can be incentiv you know, incentivized through that, that payment structure. We also know that traditionally youth will be uh, more tech savvy and therefore can take advantage of some of these digital uh, tools to engage um, in agriculture. So a real opportunity to create jobs in rural areas. Um, and finally, I thought very interesting in that, yes, we have this very heavy kind of incentive model, but important not to sort of double down on that incentive model too quickly and, and allow your, your agents that, that opportunity to in, embed themselves in the organization and really get used to some of the, the tools um, that, that you're asking them to, to deliver on behalf of the smallholder farmers. So I just at this point, really, we'd just like to say thank you uh, to all our panelists, um, to Shri, to Anne, to Emmanuel, for taking the time today and for sharing your insights. Um, and thank you to all the participants uh, for your questions and, and for listening in. Um, and if, if you do have a, you know, any questions um, or you'd like to know more or to, to, um, to see some of the presentation that you saw today, then, then please do feel, feel free to drop, drop us an email, um, as you can see on the screen. Um, so have a great rest of the conference, um, and, and we look forward to, to speaking again in the future. Thank you, everyone.